Ronette, can you call me? Hi, everyone. We are recording live to YouTube, and we will start recording this Zoom session as soon as we admit a few more people and get started. So thanks for joining. Kristen, I'm going to call you on cell. Okay, sounds good. Matt, I'm going to call you on cell. Good afternoon, everybody. We'll get started in just a minute. Kristen Spring, everything okay on the on the yes, uh, hosting gonna, side? I'm, I'm going to call you on cell phone right now for one more configuration. Thanks. We can't hear you, Spring. Thanks, David. Matt, I had mentioned earlier that we are recording to YouTube and we'll start the Zoom recording as soon as I admit a few more people and we get started. We'll just wait one more minute for folks to come into the room and then we'll start the recording and get rolling, all right? Thank you for being here. Okay, Kristen, I don't know if you have power to pause or start recording. Go ahead. Thank you. So thanks again for being here. This is uh, Matt Wettstein. We're here for the All College Zoom to talk about the change to 
shifting to in-person instruction in higher levels and also return to campus for the fall semester. Second of our Zoom meetings, and um, this one will be less presentation, more time for question and answer. Uh, and I do wanna, however, at the start of it, I do wanna share screen to just do a little bit of the agenda uh, and talk about structure as we go forward. So give me a moment to bring that up. Uh, as I said, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time reviewing the same slides from last time, um, but I did wanna have the ability to show a few of them as we start. One of the things I wanna do is um, start with the agenda. I, I wanna start with apologies and clarifications, uh, and then a few of the slides that we'll go over and then invite you to do Q&A um, for most of the session today. Um, starting with apologies, I just wanna start from the perspective of uh, apologizing for last week's meeting and the way that the shift from some of the categorical statements we had made in the past to this new change uh, impacted the college, impacts you, you students, staff, faculty. And I just wanna um, acknowledge the mistake that I made as incident commander and president was in being very categorical in the language up until recently about Are Sorry about that. Muted? It looks like I got muted very briefly. I just want to apologize for that. I the mistake that I made was in not being more flexible in saying that look, if things change, we we've got to be ready to pivot. Uh, and I think as a college we do need to to make that pivot. Uh, and I've got some, obviously, some justification for that that we can talk about. Um, the other thing I want to focus on in terms of the chat for today is to encourage you to use it for questions uh, and to also give the opportunity to raise hands as we get towards the, oh, about 15 minutes in here to, to ask questions live. Um, I think one of the unfortunate features of chat is sometimes it can spiral. Uh, and I'd appreciate um, addressing questions through the chat or through the raise hand feature today. That's fine either way. Uh, and I do wanna make the pledge that the questions that we have from last week's session and also from today, um, I, I do have the ability to archive obviously all the chat comments and questions and we will address all of those in a forthcoming FAQ document as we start to develop the, the protocols and uh, how to come back operating safely. Right, so with that, I'm just gonna go over um, a couple of the slides that we had from the last time and the factors for making this decision. Uh, one of the reasons is that vaccination rates went up so fast in our county um, that our thinking about uh, reopening really got transformed by what was happening in April and May in Santa Cruz County. I'll show that slide again about the vax rates. Um, it really also got transformed by the governor in May, making the announcement about an, a forthcoming reopening of California announcement uh, and changes in protocols that were gonna be accompanied with that from uh, entities like the California Department of Public Health and Cal OSHA. And then of course the local districts and, and other universities and colleges making changes uh, and I can certainly report today on other community colleges making similar decisions about reopening for the fall semester. Um, I showed this slide at last time. I won't uh, expand too much on this, but the dashboard for COVID cases in Santa Cruz County has looked very promising in the last few weeks. Uh, and the, the positivity rate for COVID has really dropped significantly to levels that are very much in line with what we were seeing in March of 2020 at the very start of the pandemic. So the fingers are crossed that we're gonna continue on that trajectory and that that longitudinal curve is really leveled out uh, for our county. And I showed this slide last time as well. So we're at a point where uh, more than 50% of the population in our county is vaccinated. More than 61%, now 62% of our 18 and over population in Santa Cruz County is vaccinated as well. Uh, I wanna reflect a little bit on some of the student comments that we're getting in surveys that were being done through the climate survey in early May, and then uh, recently completed 
Title V survey that was um, just put in the field really in the last week of the semester. Uh, and what the students were saying in this one particularly, which was a, a very quick sense of belonging survey, was that they were really struggling with that because of being fully online. I will say too that one of the really heartening things about the survey is that the students were so grateful for the work of the college, the staff and faculty throughout the year in doing everything they could to make them feel connected to the college and, and really trying to have the experience be good for them. As one of the, the one in pink here in, in the box says, it, a lot of the comments say, you guys did a really great job at trying to connect us and, and keep us focused. So uh, a lot of comments like that, but also overwhelming comments about wanting to come back, that they miss the college, they miss being on campus, they miss being able to be in class with students and staff. And similar kinds of refrain from the students in the climate survey as well. So they're wanting the campus to be opened up and it's very frequently the kind of email that I get in my inbox, as I said last week. So uh, summarizing the message that went out, uh, we're looking to do as a target, 60% of our classes in face-to-face -face mode. One of the things to note about that is that face-to-face uh, -face can be hybrid. So if you think about the combination of just totally face-to-face, uh, -face, um, always on campus, always on ground at either Watsonville or Aptos, and or a hybrid approach where some of it's face-to-face -face, um, and you're alternating, for example, between let's say a lecture lab format, uh, that would certainly fall within that category. We are gonna ask people to get mandatory vaccinations with an opt out for uh, the exemptions that are required by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That's gonna be through an interactive process with our human resources staff, uh, where um, if you have religious objections or if you have medical exemptions reasons for seeking an accommodation, there's an iterative process that uh, an employee or a student needs to go through to see if the accommodation is reasonable for the college to enter into. Uh, and we are expecting everyone to return to work on August 16th uh, and start the process of a phased re-entry to work starting on August 1. Uh, that was announced in that. And so the change that I, re I reflected last time is in what we had been presenting in prior all college Zooms was that uh, the real change is in that fall 21 approach, moving as much as we can to a 60% target for um, on uh, on-campus or in-person delivery of instruction. Um, finally, uh, I just wanted to go over some of the, the regional colleges in our system and how they are trying to pivot for the fall semester. And this is coming from a, a president's meeting uh, that took place actually yesterday morning uh, to give you the context of where our college is relative to what other colleges are doing uh, in what's called region six, the um, really the region that goes down the coast from our area down towards Ventura County. Uh, so Hartnell is trying to pivot to a 75% target for in-person sections. Um, Monterey Peninsula is in a 40 to 50% range for targeted delivery. Alan Hancock actually has um, gone back to their fall 19 schedule, rolled that over, uh, and is going to be lifting the emergency conditions and, and really going back to an 80% in-person schedule for the fall semester. Similar kinds of targets around ours, a little bit smaller at Cuesta and Santa Barbara as well. Uh, again, from the CEO conversations that uh, we were having yesterday morning. So um, that was the, the extent of the content that I was going to present uh, I don't know if Paul Harvell wants to go over again the um, return to campus working group. Um, the one thing I will, will say about this in terms of the documents that we're trying to pull together for safe operations and protocols is that in, in many ways, we're reliant on what is going to be coming out forthcoming from Cal OSHA uh, and from the California Department of Public Health revision on the institutions of higher education document. Uh, if you were paying attention to the news late last week, 
Cal OSHA does have some regulatory changes that they are proposing. They will go effective with Cal OSHA board approval on a second reading. But it's essentially requiring businesses to continue to have masks uh, when operating indoors. Uh, so we're intending to be um, pretty much in line with that. And the safety um, slide that we had from Tasha Sturm last time was envisioning that coming back in the fall semester in class uh, and certainly in, in campus buildings where we have services going on, expectation is gonna be at this moment, uh, reading those um, uh, draft guidelines is that mask wearing will be required unless you're alone in your office uh, and um, or you're eating. So for example, in a cafeteria setting or outdoors, and you should always have masks ready to be interacting with people. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there and stop sharing and just actually turn it over to questions because I think that's more important for folks to, to be able to ask their questions. So um, you have two options here. Uh, you can either post them into the chat window and if we don't get through them today, we'll make an effort to address them again in that FAQ document, along with the ones from last time. Uh, and then second, if you wanna raise your hand and actually ask a question live, I'm, I'm certainly willing to uh, entertain them that way as well. So with that, um, Tara, I'll start with your question in terms of the whole climate survey responses. Um, yeah, at some point we will do uh, presentations on the climate survey. Uh, I want to defend um, Terrence's workload because one of the things that happens with uh, in his shop is uh, one of the things that happens with these surveys is that comments will get made about individual staff or faculty, uh, and you don't necessarily want to broadcast those comments that are open-ended about individuals in a public document like that, or at least I believe you should not. So there's a part of cleaning uh, of those responses that has to get done to make it um, acceptable for public presentation. Uh, and so one of the things I'd like to say, Terrence doesn't know I was gonna do this, but I think we'll do presentation of the climate survey data uh, probably at the June 28th board meeting, uh, which will be coming up two weeks from Monday, essentially. Uh, similar kind of concern with the Title V survey. Uh, you don't, again, want staff or faculty names mentioned. Uh, so there's some uh, data cleaning that needs to get done, and then we'll, we'll try to roll that presentation out as well. All right. Uh, Jyoti, I think this was a question asked last time in terms of vaccinations for visitors to the campus. Uh, we are, we're probably not going to be in a situation where we can mandate just uh, one-off visitors coming to the campus. Uh, the intent is to have our employees and our students um, address the mandatory vaccination requirement. Uh, and again, I want to encourage people to upload uh, your VAX card to the system. Really simple process. And I indicated, I think, in the email late last week, uh, it really does only take a couple of minutes once you have the photo of your card ready to, ready to upload. Right. I'm seeing Terrence's response on the climate survey as well. All right, let me turn to Holly Goodman's question, a two-part question, would the college terminate an employee for not getting a vaccine? Um, no, I mean, Holly, I think the point there is that the vaccination process, again, is one where you would wanna have a, a conversation for um, why, why you would not have a vaccination. So there are accommodation processes that would need to be in place for that, obviously. So uh, absolutely not. Uh, is there any chance to wait and enforce, I gotta scroll down here, on the mandate until the FDA is given official approval? Actually, that is kind of the intent that we're focusing on. Like other institutions, we're waiting for the FDA to do that. Um, I anticipate that's gonna happen uh, very quickly. Um, so the way to think about it right now is if you upload your materials right now, you're in a voluntary mode. As soon as that FDA approval comes forward, I think every institution of higher ed in the country is going to do that. I will say that the EEOC um, guidelines that have been published uh, allow for employers to have mandatory vaccination as long as the accommodation process is there. So we, we have the ability under equal employment law to do that mandate. 
I, like, I think a lot of institutions are waiting for the FDA final approval, like the other institutions have said. Uh, so my approach to that is, um, you know, I've already done it. It's sort of the, you're waiting for the mandatory to happen. I, I think it's going to happen. Claudia um, asking about why 60%. Um, and you check with San Jose State, they're at fewer than 30% for fall. Um, I think I, I want to uh, reiterate this from last time, 60% is a target. I, I think it falls nicely within the survey data that we got from the climate survey. And those are data points that I mentioned in my email last week. The modal response from students, the most frequent response on, in terms of the type of class that they uh, prefer, uh, is in person. The second one is hybrid. Uh, and when you total those two together, it adds up to 73% of our students wanting some kind of in-person instruction. So um, obviously 60% is not 73. I realize I need to transition the college to a, a kind of post-pandemic mode. And I do think that a lot of colleges are gonna find, try to find a sweet spot in the next few terms of where that new normal is, because I think that there's a lot of students who appreciate the flexibility of online. They also, I think, are gonna appreciate the flexibility of a combo of online and face-to-face. -face. Uh, so, so sort of the combo lecture lab, where you have one um, that might be in, in person, one that might be online. Um, and then I think that there's also students who, who like the fully online approach, right? Uh, versus face-to-face. -face. And so getting to that sweet spot is something we're gonna have to figure out over time. Um, I, do, I do know that our enrollment uh, certainly is showing us from fall and spring uh, and current enrollment patterns for this coming fall, uh, I would argue are, are giving us really strong indications of what students are saying about our course schedule. Uh, and I wanna be very clear on this point with everybody here because it is a, uh, a kind of uh, existential uh, point for our college. Uh, recall that the fall semester, which was largely online with a lot of um, still some D D2C courses that were in person, but a substantially online semester had a drop of enrollment uh, to the tune of 15%. Uh, we are now seeing enrollment patterns for fall semester that are even more of a decline of, of 28% on top of that 15% decline. So if you start to combine those two years and contemplate a 43% drop in enrollment for our college, that is an ex existential crisis for us because 70% of our, our funding is driven by enrollment patterns. And the only thing saving us right now, um, unbelievably, is the hold harmless protection. So if we continue to see these declines in enrollment, uh, rolling out the same kind of schedule that we had last fall, uh, it becomes a fiscally unsustainable level of enrollment for us. Uh, so that is why the shift is so important because I think that many students and many students who are first generation, uh, who are from South County, from Watsonville, from North Monterey County, uh, where uh, we, we see our highest concentrations of poverty, also in Santa Cruz. That's where we've lost the enrollment. So it becomes a, an existential question about who we are as a college, who we serve, uh, and an equity question about who we are as a college and who we serve. So I think it's fundamentally important to be start addressing that problem now uh, and not wait and watch uh, and see what happens to our enrollment, all right? Um, let's see. Uh, Nicole, I'm not sure I understand the question, so maybe you can flesh it out a little more if you want to go off uh, off mute. Nicole Crane. Okay, um, actually, I asked, I asked two questions. Which one are you referring to? Hi, Nicole. Oh, Hi. I can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me? I'm, I'm off mute. Still audio problems on my side, so let's see. I can hear Nicole. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if, um, you know, maybe that's one I can try to address. Send, shoot me a note offline and I'll try to address it in the FAQ, if that's okay. So I'm not hearing audio from you at all. 
Um, is, right. Can somebody ask him if he's referring to my first uh, from question? From Cheryl, what's question? the expectation regarding student services, working with students one-on-one -on -one in tiny offices? Without we? windows. Yeah, I think um, one of the things I think is important for staff and managers to do is to get together and try to address those kinds of questions through walkthroughs of spaces and understanding spaces. This is a particularly important question for counselors, um, Disability Center, ASC, spaces like that. Um, I think you're okay in limited time frames uh, being together with Mass on in those locations. And certainly John's work with the vendor, uh, with Geo Wilson, and getting the HVAC systems addressed is also important to this question. Um, so let me talk about that process and then uh, come back to the, the office visits. Um, what we did with the, the fall semester classes is we had those mechanical assessments take place. So it's sort of a, a two-step process. Go in and assess what the airflow quality is like, assess what the filters are in those systems, and then remediate. Uh, and so in, in almost all of the cases of rooms and buildings last fall that we brought up online, uh, many of them, not many of them, but a good percentage of them passed. But for a lot of them, the airflow had to be upped to increase the cycling of new air into the rooms. Uh, and then also there was a filter replacement that took place to make sure that we were using uh, what I described as MERV 13 filters. So um, they're blocking smaller and smaller particles the higher you go up on that MERV rating. Uh, and they're designed to trap uh, viruses in the filter system. So the report that we have for the fall semester courses and buildings that were opened up for D2C classes uh, we, have, we have a master spreadsheet that has the, the room location or building, um, the remediation that was done by the vendor and addressing the, the airflow quality. So all of that work's going on right now with a lot of our, our additional rooms that we're looking to bring back on. And obviously John is scrambling with the vendor to make sure that that set even grows bigger so that we're addressing the buildings we need to address. So... The shorthand on that is that by, by mid-July, we should have a good read on all of our buildings and have the filtration done, filter replacement, uh, and know if the airflow is good enough to do the work that we want to do in these buildings. So on the individual appointments, uh, what I would say is that the hope is that once we finish that HVAC assessment, the airflow circulation in those circumstances is going to allow you to have the kind of like a 30-minute uh, session one-on-one -on -one in a room. The goal also, I think, is to try to space as much from um, faculty to student in that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, but, you know, in, in some cases, if that's unable to be done, it may be that in working through with the managers of the unit, uh, we end up doing more online meetings than we do face-to-face -face in those settings, right? So still work to be done on that. Um, office hours, um, I'm sort of skipping down now to Leticia's question about office hours and remaining on Zoom. Um, same kind of response, right? I mean, assess the office. Uh, with faculty meetings, you know, sometimes you have to be looking at material on the computer or um, a sheet, but um, you can also become a fan of the Kathy Welch approach to walking meetings, uh, taking a meeting outside, uh, in, in meeting with individual students outside of the office rather than being cooped up. Um, that's a, another approach okay. that could be considered, right? I'm listening to my college president talk about why we have... Okay, Jeff, you're raising a point about the mass guidance from the CDC. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's why I think what's gonna happen with the, um, the guidance from the state of California is very much promoting the continued wearing of masks uh, to prevent the spread, for sure. Matt, this is just an audio check. Can you hear us? Kristen, I'm gonna rely on you if you see any hands up. Um, I'm, I don't have the participant window open up. I guess I could. Kristen, I, you can't hear us. You can't hear anybody. Okay. No. Thank I'm you. calling. 
Yeah, Cheryl, I, um, honestly, I don't know about on the release of the information on the uh, mechanical assessments. If I think if it's the case, I can maybe ask John to do that. If, um, if the assessments come back, um, there you go. Well, that help. I, I just realized I had a, um, <laughs> I had my headphones plugged in and uh, was not hearing people. So uh, my apologies. Oh my goodness. Talk about a Zoom rookie error. Can um, you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Thanks, Joe. Go ahead. So, and Nicole, that's probably the reason I couldn't hear you earlier. Do you want to go back to your question and raise that? My apologies. Sure, Matt. I wasn't sure which question you were um, referring to, but I had asked two. The first was about if we require some portion of the class, i.e. it's a hybrid class, if we require some portion to be in person, um, those students who are unable to attend because they are somewhere else, are, are they then just dropped or are there, do we have to teach in two different formats? So I was curious about that. And then the yeah. other question was about the survey data and if it was about in general, do students prefer online classes or specifically for the fall? I think the question was um, kind of a generalized question of the type of, of course, type of mode of inst or mode of instruction that you prefer. Um, Terrence can help me out. He can probably ask, uh, access it really quickly. Um, I do not want faculty trying to do high flex, right? So um, I think it's asking too much, for example, to say like, um, Although it might be possible and people might want to do it, like the combo of having a Zoom room going while you're in person with people, that's just way overkill for me. And I get that that workload approach is just, it's not right to ask you, ask you to do that. Um, I think that if a shift in a course section um, is, you know, going to have that kind of an impact on students, we're, we're trying to minimize that, obviously, but uh, and that was one of the reasons why we closed enrollments of 10 or less on sections to, to start making the changes on them first to minimize the impact. Um, it, it's gonna depend, I think, in, in disciplines, right? So I think it's important for faculty to have discussions with chairs and deans about, you know, large enrollment multi-section course areas are different from, let's say, oceanography right? Where you're only going to have one section or two sections anyway, right? So it's a different conversation about the change in mode uh, when we're talking about English 1A or Com Studies or uh, History or Poli Sci than when we're talking about uh, individual or smaller departments, right? But there are going to be impacts, no doubt, right? What we're trying to do, though, is recognizing that the current enrollment trends are telling us it's a warning sign. People are not enrolling at the rates that we need them to be enrolling. Uh, so that's the, that's the suggestion to me uh, from an enrollment management perspective of saying we've got to make a change and put more into the schedule that's face-to-face. -face. Uh, and that will impact students who've made plans already Hopefully they can, they can change those plans. If not, they may end up losing that course and have to shift to another course, right? Recognize that's gonna happen. Is that, Nick, Nicole, did that help? Yes, that, that, that did help. So I guess what I'm hearing is if there's two sections, for example, one could be online and one could be in person. If there's one section and a third of the class can't do it because they're online, uh, um, because they've made other plans to be online, then I guess what you're saying is we should keep it online so we don't cut those students out. The other thing around that same um, question that I'm curious about is, is the reason why enrollment is so much lower at this moment for the fall, is it because a lot of students aren't worried about enrollment? Because in fact, for the spring, you know, all of them got in really, because we were all online. So a lot of my students are emailing me saying that they, they're not enrolling right now because they're going to wait because they don't, they, they know they're going to get in. So I was wondering if that's, if that someone's factored that in. Thanks, Matt. Okay, that, that may be happening. Uh, my expectation is that when students get appointments to register, man, you better jump on those appointments, right? Because um, it, the, the, the classes that generate the bulk of our enrollment, it, I've said this, I don't know if this is widely known among this group, but 50% um, of our enrollment is driven by 20 courses point blank. 
uh, and they have the, the 20 most popular courses in our, our catalog. They're transfer directed, they're um, general education requirements, they're requirements for graduation, right? So um, those are large volume classes that fill really quickly. Uh, so they are often the barometers that you can look at in terms of what's going to happen with overall enrollment. The other thing is that you know this from being in, in the STEM area, there are science prep courses that fill like that. So students who are sitting out and thinking that they're just going to be able to get courses, even in an online environment, that's not a good strategy to be thinking about for registration for college. Um, so um, you know, I would hope that students, when they get their, their registration appointments, jump on them and, and jump into the classes they're looking to do, right? So that's why I think it's so critical to be watching that enrollment trajectory and making a change like this right now rather than waiting until July, right? So you, you, that's why I think it's important to make this change, right? Okay, um, let me shift to chat again. Um, and I need to jump back up, sorry. This was one of the features I, I saw about last week is um, um, I was trying to answer questions toward the top and there were a lot of comments going on in the chat window. So um, let me scroll back up. And Kristen, yes, my headphones were plugged in, so. Okay, um, so let me go to um, Sarah Castillo's question about before COVID, we had CalFresh and also county employees, will they be required to show vaccine cards? You know, I think, um, again, I wanna focus on the mandate for it, that we can impose is for our students and employees. It's difficult for us to impose mandates on non-employees, right? So we may have occasional visitors like that who come on our campus like CalFresh or Second Harvest. Um, we have folks who are affiliated with County Office of Ed who run Delta Oasis or alternative education programs. Um, as a part of our contracts with them, uh, particularly for the department, uh, um, uh, County Office of Ed programs, they, they probably are already vaccinated, quite frankly, because they were taking part in the same kinds of vaccination programs as you. Um, but we could potentially have something in the contract for them. But for visitors like that, there are going to be uh, occasional visits once a month at either Aptos or Watsonville. We're probably not going to be able to impose a um, vaccine restriction on them. Thus, the importance of continuing to wear masks and um, be protecting people through the, the mask wearing. Um, yeah, from Nicola, the question is about what's going on with other colleges in terms of drops in enrollments. The drop in enrollment is systemic for the entire system. Um, there are varying levels depending on high school uh, graduation rates, demographics. Um, ours is probably a bigger drop because of the population that we serve. So some of you have heard me talk about the fact that 10% of our students, for example, are over the age of 50. Uh, and that is very different from some of the Central Valley and rural colleges where it's a much younger population that they serve. So their drop may not be as, as significant as ours. Uh, however, I think systemically, if you look at enrollment reports that are coming into the, the chancellor's office, and I'm particularly interested in looking at the July what are called uh, second period apportionment reports because they capture spring enrollment. I think that the system is going to see a massive decline in enrollment from the fall and spring that we just went through. Uh, and I think it's, it's rather substantial. I was um, on a phone call with Paul Steenhausen from the Legislative Analyst Office back in April. And I, I said to him, I think we're gonna have um, a disappearance of 100 to 150,000 students total from the entire system um, spread out across all the colleges. So it's a drop that's happening everywhere. Ours is probably more significant because of COVID and fire from last fall and all the dislocation that that meant to our campus and our communities, right? 
Matt, just a follow up because I think you misunderstood my question about the masks. Maybe. Um, yeah. Go CDC, ahead, Jeff. CDC in no way is recommending masks for vaccinated people. Yes. Agreed. So we don't have to do that. No, I'm vaccine. saying that for for everyone who comes on campus, be vaccinated and be ready to be wearing your masks. Which is the opposite of the guidance. What's the guidance say? I'm maybe I'm misunderstanding it, Jeff. If you're vaccinated, no mask necessary. Well, I think the importance for us from a safety perspective is that um, you can occasionally have vaccinated people actually develop COVID, right? Um, and there was a report this morning, I think in Marin County of the first uh, fully vaccinated person dying from COVID. So I, I think that the double protection of being vaccinated and wearing masks is really important. And that's certainly the guidance I'm anticipating uh, that will get approved on second reading from Cal OSHA, that in places of, of employment, businesses like ours, where you have a lot of people uh, in rooms, the, the idea of not wearing masks, that frightens me. So I think the, the, the guidelines that I anticipate seeing from Cal OSHA and from the California Department of Public Health in the guidance for institutions of higher education, I'd be shocked if they didn't say wear masks. Okay, well, if they right. do, it would be against the CDC, but that, that might be the case. Yeah, well, I, I'll say this, and I've said this, I think all along, the guidance, the big guidance document that we've been following all along has been the California Department of Public Health Guidance for Institutions of Higher Education. That's sort of our Bible, um, and we'll continue to use that as our, um, our guidance for how to operate safely. Okay. Let me go to um, Liz asking a question about Liz Saluri. Will employees be equipped with video conferencing tech in their offices? So if you wanted to be able to host online office hours from their office between uh, in-person classes. Um, that's a good question. I uh, honestly, I don't know the answer to that, Liz. I think that I was, um, we were actually talking about this in cabinet this morning about how to run governance meetings in the new, um, in the new term. Uh, and I was um, speculating that we might have hybrid kinds of meetings. Um, so I can imagine, for example, some of us in our offices with our laptops uh, connected to the network that way and having, um, for example, a, a college planning committee meeting uh, with all of us sprinkled around the campus, maybe some of us even in 245, uh, but continuing to have Zoom-based meetings like that. So that would um, that would be my approach. Um, I don't know if that answers your question though, Liz. Do you wanna go off mic or go off mute? Okay, let me go to Barbara's question. We have GE courses like English 1A or 1B that have been available in person since May many available seats. How do we know our current enrollment pattern is due to the lack of face-to-face? -face? Um, good question. I, again, I'm not sure where those face-to-face -face courses are scheduled. Um, I do know that the students are telling us, again, in those surveys that they wanted more face-to-face. -face. There are a lot of uh, drivers that could be um, driving an individual student's enrollment. Sometimes they're looking for particular professors and certain professors fill up first. Uh, sometimes um, the time and room and location, days that the course meets are gonna matter. Um, and, you know, so I don't know, uh, you know, just on the basis of 1A or 1B, what's driving that. Uh, I am asking people though to, if we're, um, if we've got the schedule out there that like 75% online uh, and they're not filling, uh, again, I think that there's some messaging, particularly for our first time students to, to get them into the college, have a college-like experience that they're asking for. Uh, and particularly for students who came out last year as first time students uh, and want that college experience. That's the kind of messaging that you see in the student comments and in the 
um, in the materials that show up in my inbox, in the messaging, uh, that they're looking for that. All right. Raina's question, have you considered this change once they've signed up for fall that we might lose more students? Um, I, yeah, I've considered that, Raina. I think we're going to have to pay really close attention to the enrollment trajectory as we go through. Um, enrollment management is vital right now. Uh, and that's important for chairs, deans, vice president's office to be looking at on a daily basis. Uh, so good constructive enrollment management is paying attention to those enrollments. Uh, and I like to think of the schedule as a river uh, that you can either expand or contract based on decisions that you make about what the schedule of courses looks like. Um, and when I say that, there are different ways that you can expand the river. You can expand the section size and raise the cap. Uh, and that's particularly something you can do in online classes within the contours of the contract. Um, you can expand by opening sections. You can contract the river and force students to go into particular parts of the river, quote unquote, if you think of it as an analogy, by forcing the choice to these particular sections that you want to fill, right? So it's all about manipulating the shape of the river as you engage in enrollment management. Grow it, shrink it, force choice or not force choice are the kinds of decisions that you're, you're talking about here. I see Paul smiling as I'm talking about this, but Paul Harvell. Um, but that's the kind of attention that has to get paid as we watch and make these kind of, of changes. Um, certainly, I think it's easier to make the change back to an online uh, because you're not constrained then by the room and the time of the assignment at that point, right? So Claudia is asking a question about the priority of registration and how it's handled for students who registered, but now they wanna to switch to face-to-face. -to -face. Um, it may disproportionately disadvantage those students. Um, the one way to think about this is that um, once you've allowed for the registration process to start and you've done the priority reg uh, folks and they've had their shot at getting into the schedule, um, there, there are schedule changes and classes that get canceled, moved, shifted, couldn't find a faculty member. Those happen uh, in the course of a registration process. Um, so what the law provides for is their ability to register first. They've had that opportunity. If we make changes on them, obviously we wanna honor the change and treat them with respect and care in getting them a replacement section or allowing them different options to register. Uh, but it's certainly the case that we're not violating the law by having them uh, have a change in a section or in their um, educational plan for the semester, All right? Aloha is asking, um, except for students might want, need to wait to now to register since classes are being shifted, should they go ahead and register? or should they wait? That's a good question. And uh, what I would all, always encourage students to do is get in there and register. Um, and if you want to make changes later based on, on what's happening, uh, we can do that. What we are saying in the media release to, to put out to the public is to say that the expectation of these um, courses being shifted to face-to-face, -face, we're wanting people to visit after um, uh, I think it was June 15th, uh, and not hit the website right now if they're already registered, right? So um, there's a message man management issue with students who have already gone in there um, and telling them, we're gonna be making these changes, visit the website after June 15th. That gives time to the instructional procedures analyst to do some of the clean out work uh, and the setting up of sections that needs to happen. So. Paul, I think, talked about this last week is in going in and um, closing sections that had 10 students or less, for example, hiding them and making them not present for people to sign up into um, allows for the IPAs then to identify those students, have them parked uh, and out in a section shell 
uh, so that we can then process those students to say, hey, we've now changed this class. Do you want to go here? Uh, or if they've got a, a, an opportunity to go to the same course, different uh, modality uh, and process those students and, and deal with them on um, contacting them, getting in touch, having the conversation with them about what they'd like to do with the changed circumstance, all right? But I would always encourage students to take advantage of their registration appointment. Um, all right, um, what do we do? I'm, I'm going to Rachel's question about the housing challenges right now. It's, it is squeezing people for sure. Rentals um, are selling. So Rachel, I wanna get down to your question. I need to see the end of it. Yeah, I'm not sure how the housing market is impacting what's going on with our enrollment process right now. Um, I suppose one thing that could be happening, and I think this is true for North County particularly, uh, and I've, I think I've said this in prior meetings. Um, if you use the Tubbs fire and Paradise fires as examples of what might happen to our county, there was a decline in population in uh, Sonoma County, for example, uh, and in um, what the Butte College decline in enrollment uh, in the sense that people left the county because housing was an issue. They um, could not find housing or they could not rebuild. Uh, and it, it is a crisis that impacts fire impacted parts of the state. And so the example from Sonoma, uh, Santa Rosa that I'm particularly familiar with is that the county lost um, 2000 people forever. I, they're not coming back. Uh, that housing disappeared. Uh, and so that has a parallel impact on the enrollment then for Santa Rosa Junior College. And if you look at their apportionment reports, they have suffered a decline in enrollment and they've been on an emergency FTEs protection for four years now. They just applied and got another year of exemption status under the, the chancellor's office and the legal provision in the ed code. So part of what could be going on right now is a real housing crunch in our county because housing stock was lost. It disappeared. There were more than 900 homes that disappeared, right? So part of our enrollment decline is being driven by that. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and if it parallels what happened at Santa Rosa, what we wrote to the chancellor's office back in December uh, was an anticipated decline of, I don't expect 200 FTEs to ever come back to the college. Uh, but the kind of volume that we're talking about is well beyond that. And that could be driven not only by the fire, but also by the housing pressures that are going on and increasingly people moving away because they can't afford to live here, which we should see showing up if that's true in some of our neighboring districts. Uh, based on the conversations I'm having with them, I think it's a systemic problem beyond that. I think that the unfairness of financial aid regulations in our state is driving more and more first time students to see that it's actually cheaper to attend a CSU or a UC campus than it is to go to a community college because the financial aid package in Cal Grant unfairly does not apply to the cost of living factors, um, books, transportation, food uh, for our students. Cal Grants only cover tuition. And until that unfairness gets addressed, I think that our entire system is going to be on a downward enrollment slope while CSU continues to grow in enrollment. Okay, Terrence, I think has put some um, response uh, in the um, chat on how the, the wording was on the preferred mode of, of class. Right, uh, and as he indicates, we only have the responses from students who were enrolled. So we're missing uh, any kind of data from students who could not self-select into the survey because they were students at the college, largely online. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, Barbara's point, uh, and Alo Aloha's point and Barbara's point. Yeah, I mean, the students are grappling with the scheduling issue right now. They're gonna continue to grapple with it as we make these changes for sure. 
All right, Nicole. Um, many of you have increased your caps in online. If you go face to face, you've got seat limits on your labs, right? Do you want to talk about that, Nicole, a little more? Sure, but I have my mouth full. Um, <laughs> I think, um, thank you. I think Kathleen actually just, I think she addressed it. Many of us increased our caps because without being in person, m many of our classes are capped by lab space. Yeah. And so now we've let too many students in and I actually just looked and my, my classes are all full, some with wait lists. And so I have 35 students enrolled in a class. I can't fit them all in a lab anyway. So. Oops. How that work? I didn't catch the last part. You lost. I I lost audio on you, Nicole. Oh, so I was just saying that, that because I now have um, I just checked my enrollments and there my classes are all full, so there's too many, and because we didn't think we weren't prepared to go back face to face, I didn't remove that 35 student that increased cap. So now I have too many students in my lab classes, and I can't really put them all into a lab safely. Yeah, that, that's one where you're going to have to work, I think, with uh, the registration information to figure out how to um, bring that back down to the cap based on the enrollment in the class, time slot and date, right? It, or you could do your lecture in person in your lab online if the labs aren't ready. That's a hybrid. That's still another approach. That, yeah. well, that still counts as face to face. Yeah. So flip the idea of the, the in-person versus um Based, um, versus online. I mean, I understand that might meet the, the we are 60% now um, box check. However, pedagogically, that's kind of nuts, right? Because the biology class, the whole point is that you have to have your lab in person. I mean, I don't think the students really mind having the lectures online. It's really the lab portion they need in person. Yeah. No, I agree. You told me your labs weren't going to be ready for fall in person. Exactly. I don't think our, I don't, I mean, Eve can address this, but I don't think our labs can be ready anyway because our techs are off for the summer and there's too much work to get them up to speed, I think. Um, so that's- well, I, You know, I think we can be creative. Um, I, I, I've been talking about having labs maybe at half capacity, right? So where you have, you only run the easiest of labs and perhaps you have half the students in there, rotate them through. So it's kind of like a hybrid lab model. I, I think that's possible. Um, I just started talking about that with some folks and thinking about it. Um, so yeah, I think there are various possibilities out there. We just have to quickly figure them out. <laughs> so that kind of thing makes a lot of sense to me. And I guess my, my question there would be if, if some of us do those kinds of labs where we're rotating students through because we don't want too many in there, that means that we then have to do, instead of one lab, we have to do three per week, which is if we have two sections, that's six. I just don't know how that would work in terms of lab space and timing and scheduling and all that, like even for our time. Absolutely. I, I think that's going to be a major ch challenge, especially if many of our courses, many of us decide to do that. Yeah, let me address, if I can, I'm going to drop down to Reina's question about the concern about the climate survey uh, showing that a large percentage of students uh, prefer online classes. Why aren't, why isn't that being addressed beyond this? We're pulling the plug out or the rug out from students who've already registered. Yeah, I think Raina, one of the ways that I would respond to that is that um, what you're seeing from the students who were enrolled this year is they're saying, um, you know, around 30% are saying, I like online. Uh, and then another 30% I like hybrid, right? Uh, and but they're not saying 75% of them I like online, uh, and that's the problem we're trying to pivot from. That you know, moving from a schedule that was 75% online to a smaller amount and more towards a and uh, face to face because the students are saying that they want face to face, and these are the ones who endured the online um, and D2C environment that we just went through. Right, so I'm, I'm saying that there's a sweet spot that we need to get to of a mix of online and face-to-face -face instruction. And that sweet spot is not 25% face-to-face. We've already run that model. We've seen what that does to our enrollment and what the students say by voting with their feet. And many of them chose not to come to college. So to the extent that we've tried that, uh, and we saw a 15% decline. 
we need to pivot from that and recognize that there are large numbers of our students who want to be here uh, and experiencing the college face-to-face -face and in person. Uh, and that's why we need to shift from the, the schedule we had put out to a greater percentage of classes that offer them, offer them that in-person college experience. All right, um, Margarita, um, oh wait, I may be skipping one here, just a moment. Hey Matt. Yeah. I already, I already answered Margarita's question in the, um, in the responses in the chat room. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Um, Alta, has your question been answered? I answered Alta's question about hiring short-term workers also in the chat room. Yeah. Raina, I, I also recognize that my analogy of the river, while not perfect, it does, uh, when you make changes in the river, it does have an impact on the people in the river. I recognize that. Um, but it's a, we're in a situation where we can't just grow the river, right? We've got to change the river because the current shape of that river is financially devastating for this college point blank. And it's devastating for the students who are not being offered the option of face-to-face of -face instruction. Uh, and from an equity perspective, we know that there's a disproportionately large number of students who did not come to the college this past year who are poor, first-generation, and Hispanic. If we do not change, we are not serving that population well. So the, you can't just grow the river because we don't necessarily have the funds to grow the river. Uh, and I would argue that we have to be more efficient in how we put the schedule out. Um, our efficiency of students to faculty has got to improve, right? And so while that's forcing the river to be a different shape and it's gonna be disruptive to some of our students, the corollary impact is that it should be inviting more of our students to come. And the public message that it sends to the public is to say, look, we're reopening. We're making this effort. We'd like you to come back. My hope is that the community is really going to respond to that message. All right. Um, so, Lori, um, I want to make sure. Oh, you're responding, Kristen. Thank you for doing that to Lori Shipley. All right. <laughs> Jeremy, I get your message. Please don't change anything else. Um, for sure. I am, uh, I am super, one of the things that's, that came away from last week's meeting and super keyed into is um, the fatigue of everyone from the last year is really high and I get it. And so I get the frustration levels too. It's been a hard year and I, I certainly recognize that. And, you know, I continue to be amazed at what everything's done, what everyone has done. Um, it's been tough. And so I, I recognize this is really uh, a significant change, but I, I want to keep emphasizing it's a change for our students. And the hope is that we're going to serve more students by making this change, right? Um, Andrea, I'm seeing your comments about how you were relieved to see how many sections were asynchronous. Um, how, how's it going to be determined to see how many shift in person? Again, I think part of what we're trying to do here is to have conversations with between faculty, deans, and chairs to find the right ones to shift over. Um, and if they're shifting from asynchronous to um, something where there is a meeting that's scheduled at a certain time or day, you know, that's a change that the students are going to have to process and figure out if they can handle and deal with. Um, and it, if she cannot attend, for example, the student. Uh, then it's a, it's a deal where they're going to have to go in and make registration choices um, to try to figure that out. Um, that is going to be happening with our students who, who we make these shifts on. Uh, again, the point I want to make is that we're missing so many students because we don't have stuff out there for them to see in a face-to-face -face modality. But so when, when do we know this? When are we going to know? When will the students find out about, is it going to be happening 
one section at a time all summer or we'll know by July 15th or when, when, is, when are the changes gonna be made? Maybe um, Kathy or, or Paul can comment on when the changes are gonna be made. So the um, I can comment, the changes are being made um, ongoing, right? In, began a week ago or two weeks ago, whenever Matt uh, made the announcement, deans and chairs and faculty are working together. But uh, by June 15th, we expect to have a preliminary list of courses. But that doesn't mean that's the end of it. We expect that there will be shifts as we look at enrollment patterns through census and maybe even late start classes. So this is an ongoing iterative process based on enrollment trends and what we hear from students. By June 15th, we'll have our preliminary list of classes. Wait, through census? So you might switch a class from in-person to online or vice versa during the first week of classes? That... No, but if we have wait lists, we, we always make changes when we have wait lists. And that's, that's nothing new. So I'm just saying that the schedule is never set and carved in stone until we get through census. Kathy, can, you, can you comment on kind of where we are relative to the, meeting the target? We're at 47% face-to-face as of this moment. Yeah, I think one of the things is to bring the anxiety levels down a little bit and have a conversation of where we are relative to the goal, right? Um, there are certain departments where the shift to face-to-face -to -face is more welcome uh, and more in the mode that faculty are gonna want, I'm gonna presume, right? Uh, here's an example, right? I, I think, um, I, I'm, I'm not going out on a limb if I say this, I think that Cheryl Anderson would prefer to teach choral classes in the traditional mode than in a parking lot, in a hybrid mode, right? So some of those courses that are gonna change back to their more normal operating mode, I think faculty are, and students are gonna say, uh, hallelujah, right? So there are certain departments where I think it's easier to get toward a goal like that. Uh, and as Kathy's saying, you know, when I looked in yesterday and was doing a count on the registration page, I saw 259 sections that were face-to-face -face in some mode, right? And so you're, you're increasing that number as you go forward, right? To get closer to that target. Yeah, and just to, just to give an example, a further example of what Matt is saying, athletics is 100% face-to-face, -face, no surprise, right? Um, kinesiology is 90% face-to-face. Allied health is a uh, very high percentage of face-to-face. -face. VAPA is, a, is already, I think, at 84% face-to-face as a division. So there are some areas where face-to-face, um, -to, -face, to add sections, they didn't have to add very many. But when there was the opportunity to add, their faculty jumped on the chance because the, those sections work better, those classes work better in a face-to-face -face mode. Does that help, Andrea? A little bit? Yeah, yeah. That I mean that the idea that that it was gonna that you weren't gonna know whether your class was in person or async your section was in person or asynchronous until September. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's crazy making. Yeah. Even more, more so. Yeah. Right. You know, these these that examples we've already given, they're already in the conversion is in works. And any any sections that are proposed to be converted, the conversations have already been happening with the deans and the chairs and the faculty. Yeah. Kind of jumping down to Peter Shaw's question, one of the ways to um, think of this, there the curriculum committee controls what can be online versus face-to-face. -face, and we had a lot of um, work done last year to do committee approvals. Uh, but in terms of what's going on right now, in terms of what's face-to-face -face versus online, students have the ability to slice and look at the schedule of classes as either just looking at face-to-face uh, -face classes or online classes. So there's an ability to do that through our registration link for the schedule of classes. 
So um, that's when I say it, like I could go in yesterday and look and identify and count the sections that were offered online versus uh, offered on campus, right? So it's a snapshot that's moving as you make changes in the schedule, that number of sections is gonna hydraulically be shifting. Uh, and that is visible to anyone who looks at the schedule of classes. Uh, I hope that makes sense, Peter. All right. Um, you know, I think um, there's a question that is in there from Audrey about kind of the high flex approach where a student, a, a meeting could be happening in the classroom and students could be home. Um, there could be the owl feature that rotates and follows the speaker voice. Uh, and you could have rooms that are set up like that, um, which could be great for faculty who wanted to be high flex in that mode. Um, that has been approached at, at some campuses where a lot of instructional institutional dollars from HERF, the HERF funds or CARES Act have been spent on outfitting classrooms that way. Uh, you know, I think if faculty are wanting to do that in a particularized room, that's great. Uh, and we can certainly have that as a request through the, um, through the EOC for those kinds of institutional purchases, that would be something to do. I think it's a, a lift for people to do um, and make that shift, but certainly that's something we can do, right? Okay. Has anybody else had trouble uploading their vaccine cards? Asking for a friend, this is from Ulta. Um, it worked really well for me. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has had difficulty. It, it did, um, when you're in the student portal, you do have to look for the upload document button. Um, and that that's the key. And once you upload it there, it's, um, you know, it's done within a minute. All right, Conrad, how will students be contacted aside from email? I think I remember hearing about other plans for other kinds of contacts. I don't know if this was answered by uh, Kristen or anybody. Um, I think Kristen put it in the chat, right, Kristen? I think I saw something in the chat. I think so, yeah, about our email communication plans to students that will be happening on June 16th to multiple right. groups of students. And then for students who've already registered for fall, they'll receive a second communication that's more specific to their particular class from their department with instructions on what to do. We're having counselors um, reach out to students individually so they can make adjustments as needed. Okay, Serena uh, Federman makes a, a comment and question about, um, you know, the that some of the services going online was actually good, students like it and, being concerned about pivoting back 100%. I don't think that's gonna happen. So I, I think one of the things that's happening right now, and also Serena's point is about, there are some benefits from staying at home, work from home because it reduces auto trip miles, uh, greenhouse gas production and so on. Uh, and so how do we think about incorporating some of that into what we do post pandemic? I think that's gonna uh, be a part of getting to the sweet spot of where we operate as a college after the pandemic. So not only thinking about how the schedule changes for students, but also about how we serve all the student services functions and backend functions of the college that support the institution like business office or payroll or purchasing, right? I think that there's increasing interest in teleworking arrangements Right, and that's certainly something that Angela is negotiating with CCEU. Um, in a way, we already have telework kinds of approaches embedded within the faculty contract uh, in the clauses that relate to workload and assignment online versus face-to-face, -face, right? So again, I think that as we move out of pandemic mode and the return to offering in-person services, we have to be thoughtful about what is the mix of the flexible um, hours that are online available for students who might be working um, parents uh, and want to have that service delivery in the evening hours, uh, but don't want to drive to the campus, right? And so you're going to have, I think, some of that consideration in the conversations between managers and staff 
about how to think about coming back. That's especially true if we finish negotiations with CCEU uh, and there is that teleworking agreement that's at, on the table right now, um, that, that becomes a really important conversation about how are we gonna serve people uh, for the college in that flexible mode, right? So I don't wanna negotiate in public, uh, I can't, but I know that, and Angela is shaking her head, don't. Um, but, you know, it's something that is on the table and being talked about with the classified union uh, through negotiations. All right. Okay, the question from Denise about nutrition. Uh, scheduled face to face, it's under enrolled, but it's at a less desirable time. Um, however, the online sections are also not yet full. And we are supporting equity by offering both options since we do have students enrolled in both versions, right? So by increasing face-to-face -face while maintaining an online president presence, perhaps we better address equity issues. I think that's getting at kind of the crux of the issue, right? Especially on a class like that or a class that's in, um, you know, multiple section modalities, by offering the student the choice, it's a better option for them. And particularly if they want to benefit from the in-person instruction and being on campus for services along with being there for the class. So yeah, thanks Denise, appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, um, Nicole, I'm not understanding your comment about the data, um, two different interpretations of the data. Maybe I misspoke in talking about them. Matt, I gave a response in the chat. And, okay, uh, good, thank you. Again, this is me not being able to stay up, up with the chat. Okay, got it. Right. Is there anyone who wants to vocalize a question that may not have been addressed while I'm catching up? Yeah, I, I do. Um, this is Deirdre Scholar. Hi, Matt. I um, actually wrote you a direct message. May I ask a question? <laughs> so um, cool. you haven't gotten there yet. Hi. So um, I'm really interested in this high flex model. Um, we've already converted two classes that we have parallel in per I mean, um, parallel online. So out of four courses, um, we basically have 50% that are offered in person or online, which is great. But then the conversion of um, my dean was saying, you know, you need to convert one more course. Now, this, the choices for the fall are courses that we previously switched to online because the in person enrollments were low on those. And they bumped the enrollments a lot by switching them to online. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just really concerned. There's only 10, like one class has, I think, 10 out of 50 currently enrolled for the online. Um, but switching that now to in-person, I'm really worried about that. You know, I mean, again, it's only June and this is for fall. But I think with the high flex model, it could work really well. My main concern about the high flex is the um, technology component and the uploading of the videos. Yeah. So that it can be watched also async asynchronously. Um, and I wonder if we could get creative about um, maybe student workers who could attend those lectures, maybe monitor the chat, maybe make sure the technology is working and then make sure the videos get uploaded. Like that to me seems like a pretty low cost way of making that model, which to me is the ideal situation because it offers the flexibility, every possible flexibility for students, if they want to come, if they want to watch it live from home, or if they want to watch a video of it later. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that we've covered all our bases there, but as faculty, I just can't like take on that whole other technology and video piece because it's just, it, it puts me over the top. You know, I just am like going to go absolutely insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering about that support for that so that we're not leaving anyone pulling the rug out from any uh, any person 
classes that we don't have two options for the students, an in-person and, and an online, that we could offer that high flex and give faculty the support to make it happen. That's just throwing that out there. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a perfect example of uh, an idea to really advance and push forward for the the help, right? So um, I, I, when I hear that kind of a, an approach, I'm really uh, open to it. And I would say that you know, there's an example, as long as the technology can work in the room, um, hiring a student worker, using the emergency funds or the ARP funds, the American Rescue Plan funds, is a perfect example of using that um, funding stream to ensure the continuity of instruction in the way that you want to innovate, right? So to me, that's um, a very low cost use of technology and staff to achieve something you want to do, right? So, you know, I, you know, I'm putting people on the spot, but put the plan together uh, and the hiring of a student worker between now and August to do that is something that we should shoot for. Uh, and I would say that, you know, in normal times, if we didn't have the American Rescue Plans and the HERF Higher Ed Relief Funds, you know, be like, okay, where are we going to get the money for that? But we have the money. Do you know what I mean? The other thing about that model is by having a student worker in the room, if something came up where, you know, here's my big fear about being in a class with 65 people, say that, um, you know, someone doesn't wear their mask and another student gets upset that someone's not wearing their mask. And I mean, you know, this stuff happens in grocery stores all the, all the time. And I, it would be you know, if there were both that person and myself trained in how to deal with those kinds of situations, because that's also a big fear of mine are those kinds of situations coming up. And so another sort of employee, if you will, in the room, um, you know, trained in how to, you know, so I don't know, I just think there could be a lot of benefits to it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it'd be like having another adult in the room to help out in that circumstance. Uh, and that's one of the things I also wanted to impart the message that um, for me, the mask, you know, like masking and enforcing that in, in class is um, I, I think um, the approach to take with it is to think of it as a, a disruptive student behavior problem, right? Uh, and under education code, every faculty member has the right to um, essentially kick a student out for 48 hours uh, and require them to have to come talk to you and or the dean uh, about their disruptive behavior. I also think that you're gonna have a lot of allies in the room to back you up on the mask mandate. So I, you know, my message to faculty is gonna be, do not tolerate non-mask wearing. Um, kick them out and the, um, address it through the, the Maxient, you report it. It's a student discipline problem. They have to come talk to you before they can come back to class and they have to come wearing a mask obviously, right? So yeah, I love the idea of what you wanna do, but again, you know, for high flex, like the approach you're suggesting, that's an, a labor intensive approach, right? And if you're willing to do it, I would argue getting labor to help you is important. Uh, and so put the proposal in to ask for it, right? I see a couple of hands up. So I'm gonna to shift to Ariba Alston Williams and let her ask a question. Go ahead, Ariba. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah. I know that we've been talking a lot about classroom and things like that. And I just want to, you know, change over a little bit to student services. Like we are definitely um, ready to come back and be with our students. You know, our focus, especially in student services, always to do our best for the students. But we want to be able to do that safely. And we want to make sure that we're having good communication um, with everybody involved, letting people know exactly what some of our concerns are um, and making sure that we're not being, you know, not being heard. Um, and also that the things that we've talked about have been, you know, considered. Um, we are uh, cramped in a lot of our offices with, you know, the airflow. I do appreciate the study that's been going on and um, any upgrades that'll be happening, but my concern is like when I return, I wanna make sure that I have, you know, a safe space to talk to the student in. And I also 
don't want to take my focus away from the students doing, you know, some kind of health check rotation and being like primary we responsible. And yes, I do believe that we have lots of students who want to work and want to be student, um, you know, student employees of ours, but they are here to go to school. And yeah. the responsibility doesn't lie on them. It's going to rely on the staff and the faculty. And I just want to keep that in mind that, you know, especially in student services, we are in tight quarters and we're stretched, you know, as far as getting out there and putting in time for health checks and things like that. And I just want that to be, you know, the workload will increase. We do know that and we need that to be taken into consideration. Yeah. No, good points, Ariba, and I want to honor them too. The, the, the importance of the documents from organizations like Cal OSHA and the, the higher ed document that I mentioned earlier is that they, they offer really good guidelines on what to do in, within buildings and within spaces. So the kinds of things that you're used to seeing in other uh, areas like in stores and other places that have been opened uh, and will be opening up even more like the physical distancing markers and giving instruction to people like looking at floors or barriers and plexiglass are all things that are gonna be in those documents that we're gonna to have to pay attention to. Uh, and I get it in, in particularly in your area, uh, counseling services, you know, things like that, where we've gotta be very attentive to distancing issues. Um, again, that guidance is gonna be changing, I think on June 15th. Um, and so we want to follow that and make sure that we're operating in a safe, safe mode. So be thinking about, I guess I would say to staff particularly, be thinking about how do you, how do you use some of those um, protocols that you've seen in other places to layer on top of how we operate uh, in the student services functions, for example, or in the business office, other areas like that, right? So some of that is embedded in those documents and we'll, we'll honor those and be faithful to those processes and protocols, okay? Um, Kendall, I see your hand up as well. And I, I know I owe you an email on Flex, but um, Flex Week, but do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, I actually have a different question, but I will be emailing you as well about Flex. Um, so my department, you know, we're communication, we're heavily reliant on in-person discussion. And um, some of the main concerns in my department are things like how many students are we going to have in person? Is there going to be a lowered cap to allow for social distancing? What is the exact space of social distancing? Um, when will we know what rooms and technology and all of those things will be available? Because part of the problem for our courses is how can we uh, like, so maybe by June 15th, we know whether it's in person or online, but then how much longer is it going to be until we get these details? Because I know myself, I'm eager to start actually planning and getting my courses ready so I can communicate with my students but we can't really plan anything until we get that type of information. I know other people were wondering as well too, like is group work gonna be allowed in a classroom setting? Cause that's something that can change how we would design our whole course structure. So those were some of the questions that came up in my department. Yeah, and again, I think the guidance documents that we get from particularly that institutions of higher ed uh, guidance document is gonna be changing between where it is right now and where it is with the California reopening. So some of those questions I think are gonna get answered uh, when that document changes. And I, I honestly don't know the answer on the social distancing right now, right? I think that that one is in play and being discussed right now, uh, whether it's three feet, six feet, whether there's any kind of distancing at all, okay? Go ahead, you had a follow up. Yeah, just do we have any idea of a date by which we will know that for faculty's sanity? <laughs> yeah, my hope is that it's June 15th uh, because the, the um, you know, it sort of coincides with the governor's announcement of what he was wanting to do with the um, reopening California approach. Um, the Cal OSHA regulations are being 
process pretty quickly. They had a, a preliminary vote or first reading last week. And I forget the date that they had for second reading, but those are, are pretty much in place, uh, I think to go effective July 1, but I may have that date wrong. Um, but um, that, that guidance document should be getting updated right now. If it's not, I, I think it would be pretty derelict for them not to have a release document very soon, right? Uh, Cheryl, do you wanna go ahead and um, I'll take your question? Cause I, the other chat ones, I think I can address through write, written FAQs. Cheryl Kern. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. I, it was in the chat, so maybe you're about to address it, but my question is, are students being encouraged to be vaccinated or is it required? And if it's required, how will it be enforced? That question's been in the chat a couple of times. Yeah, so um, we will be, uh, the way I wanna say it is we will be requiring students if they're gonna be on campus to be vaccinated. Uh, the enforcement mechanism, uh, again, they're gonna be asked to upload into the system. That's relatively easy to do. Uh, the enforcement will be, um, you know, it, it basically we can enforce it through having the records available to people in the student information system. What I don't necessarily want everybody to be thinking about is asking for their VAX cards. In fact, do not do that. I do not want you doing that. Uh, by mandating what we're essentially doing is having them um, give us their record so that we can have it stored in our student information system, all right? And so one of the things we could do is uh, at the first week at registration or at the first week before census, for example, uh, be checking our SIS records, our student information system records against the rosters that we have, right? Uh, and that's an, an easy, unobtrusive way to be checking on students. That's why you wanna to continue to ask them to wear masks because if they're not yet vaccinated and they're coming to class, we wanna be able to have them enrolled in or attending those classes at least in a more safe way. Uh, yeah. But let us, let us get to a point of addressing the, how are we gonna mandate this later, right? Can I, I'm just, I'm asking from a perspective of student services, not just from classes. So we're talking about students walking up for Correct. tutoring, walking up to our front desk, making appointments before they're registered in classes so that we can help them get set up at the college and get started. Correct. And in, in some of those cases, they're not going to be vaccinated yet. Uh, so that's why you want to be able to interact with members of the public in a masked up environment. You're wearing a mask, they're wearing a mask, right? Uh, if, however, later when they're coming in to take advantage of, for example, services in the hub, services in the ASC, the anticipation is that they're registered for classes, which means we should have a vaccination record on them. Does that make sense? We see a lot of students who are not yet registered for classes for one-on-one -on -one meetings in closed offices. Absolutely, I get that, yeah. And that's why I think, again, that's why we wanna have the masks on in those contexts. Right. Kristen, you had your hand up. I, I know we're coming up on the 2.30 hour. I did. I was asking on behalf of an earlier question about uh, STEM and MLC in-person tutoring from Jeffrey Bergamini. Uh, Kristen, that's been answered in the chat. Great. Okay. Thank you. Great. And good to hear your dog is behaving well in the background, the young puppy. Barely. <laughs> um, I I, I want to thank everybody for being here. We're running up against the 2.30 hour. As I promised, I, I do want to address FAQs. And so if there are questions in the chat, I have the ability to store those and bring those into my document that I already have from last week. Um, the other thing is I want to, again, apologize. I know this is a big change. And part of the problem is that in saying all along before, we're going to be online in the fall it did not recognize that conditions could change. So I wanna apologize for that. Uh, and I also wanna thank you for your willingness to, to roll with the change. I hope this is gonna be good for our students. I think it will. And I think the more that we think about serving the public in in-person services and on campus, I think that they are really going to appreciate it in our community. So thanks everybody, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for being here today.